Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kyle Hill's videos. Specifically, was evacuating Fukushima a mistake? In an emergency response scenario, an evacuation is not always the conservative action. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some though. Let's get right into this. After multiple reactor meltdowns in 2011, over 160,000 people were evacuated from the cities and towns surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. More than 10 years later, even with the majority of evacuation orders lifted, almost no one has returned home. Now that is a major, major evacuation. I kind of had it easy at the plant that I worked at. It was in rural Texas. We really had it pretty easy out in the boonies. I can only imagine what it would be like in a populated area. So the reactor has the exclusion zone, which is the innermost shape. That is where the nuclear power plant licensee, meaning the people that own the nuclear power plant, basically have the authority to determine all activities, including exclusion or removal of personnel and property from the area if something were to happen. It can still be traversed. Obviously, there are roads, and provided that under normal conditions, the plant doesn't interfere with the, with the roads, and the roads don't interfere with the plant, which they don't, but... In the case of an emergency, the plant has authority in that area. And then you have the low population zone outside the exclusion area. What's interesting is 10 CFR Part 100, the federal law that specifies reactor site criteria, doesn't actually have a number for the low population zone. It uses the term, the total number of density of which are such that there is a reasonable probability that appropriate protective measures could be taken on their behalf in the event of a serious accident. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, it's vague on purpose for collaboration between the site and local authorities. Like, we didn't, act we didn't actually work with the federal government at, at that plant. It was mainly with the local, the local county, the, the county judge, and... We didn't. We technically don't issue evacuation orders. We issued evacuation recommendations to this zone, and then there are there are zones that are further out from the low population zone that are considered. This is the one that's defined in the low population zone, and then they look at nearest population centers of about twenty five thousand people. But that that part of this in of this law, we'd usually look further than that one because depending on where you're located, you could have the nearest population of 25,000 people could be 30 miles northwest, but you could have another population center of 50,000 people 50 miles east. So you're still going to want to do a 360 degree assessment and response, and a lot of it will depend on which way the wind's blowing as far as where you issue your recommendations. We had it easy compared to Fukushima, just in terms of site criteria. Ambient radiation rates much higher than anything I saw in Chernobyl. Well, part of that's time, decay time. Cesium-137 has a half-life of about 30 years. Though this is kind of surprising to me too, considering Fukushima released one-tenth that of Chernobyl, and a lot of it was blown out to sea. I mean, yeah, we're talking, you know, 7 to seven to 20 microsieverts per hour. That That is higher than normal background, though you wouldn't actually, you'd have to be there for quite a while before there's any increased health effect. That's at 100 millisieverts, or about 10,000 hours worth at this rate. On the first day, an evacuation order was issued within a three kilometer radius of the plant. Later the same day, people within a 10 kilometer radius were ordered to stay indoors. So three kilometers is comparable to that of the low population zone, at least where, where I worked at. Now granted, these numbers aren't always gonna fly, because because note that the criteria that's federal law in the US is different than laws in Japan, and the one that I'm familiar with doesn't actually have a number requirement. Or let me rephrase that, a generic number requirement. Numbers are only in the applicable 
technical specification and emergency response guides for an individual site because it because it depends on you know the areas that are populated and this is briefed on each team's emergency uh, planning now on shift when these sort of when you need to activate the emergency plan at three o'clock in the morning on christmas day or something like that because that's inevitably when these sort of big events will happen when you have barely any crew to work with at least in the scenarios that i've trained for the on-site uh shift supervisor actually becomes the emergency director because you're the first responder you can you have all of the operators and uh, maintenance technicians and health physics experts with you to one stabilize the plant you know stop the accident from from getting any worse to align all of the teams both your on-site response teams and then and off-site government agencies and then you develop your recovery plan so you would activate this emergency plan. It's kind of like it would usually show up in the form of a direct message to everyone. You'd call in the duty team. So here that they're all going to be coming in, ruin whatever vacation they happen to be on. And then they're all mobilized and you have to and you deal with it. And in the case of like a Fukushima type thing where you have fuel damage, a that is when you would get to fuel damage and potential for release. I mean, look, the whole this whole area is an emergency zone because of the earthquake and tsunami already. So we're stacking emergency plans on top of other emergency plans. Then you would look at the weather, depend um, which areas are downwind. Do a calculation to see where the dose is going to be the worst, where the where the plume is going to be going. If if there's a release, and then you have that with the then you direct that recommendation to the local authorities, and they would carry out if it's evacuation or shelter in place. A lot of times, immediately, in the event of an earthquake and tsunami. Now, I know this wasn't instant because it took a bit of time for the plants to. Uh, to lose everything and for the for the for the station blackout to occur and things to escalate it can get pretty pretty crazy now one thing i will specify is just because you're entering the emergency plan that does not mean you're ordering an evacuation or even a shelter in place order that's at the highest emergency level or um, level four or a general emergency when you would do this there are other times where you'd activate the emergency plan and just mobilize all of the support personnel, the, d the duty team, as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or whatever the Japanese equivalent would be in this case. You solve the problem, mitigate the accident, and no evacuations or shelter in place or anything that really affects a member of the public happen. Fukushima was severe enough, plus combined with an earthquake and tsunami, then yeah, I can... I can understand the logic as far as why they did what they did. The next day on March 12th, the evacuation zone was extended to 20 kilometers from the plant. This is what the evacuation orders look like by that April. A strict evacuation zone, a planned evacuation zone, and a prepare to evacuate zone. So you can see we're kind of merging the um, the nuclear plant's emergency response are somewhat being combined with, you know, your post-earthquake recovery plans and tsunami stuff. So there isn't really a specific guide for that that I'm aware of. You're basically combining two emergency plans and agreeing on an evacuation plan based on both events happening at the same time. That's why Fukushima evacuation was so much more challenging than say the Three Mile Island evacuation because you have to evacuate for the natural disaster too. In total, almost 3% of the Fukushima prefecture was affected by evacuation orders. By 2017, six years after the meltdowns, many evacuation orders had been lifted, the exceptions still being the so-called difficult-to-return zones, closest to the plant and directly under the radioactive plume it produced. In 2023... Yep, just because it just happened to be directly under the plume, the wind just happened to be blowing that particular direction when the accident happened. More evacuation orders were lifted, including small portions of the difficult-to-return zones. This is all undoubtedly progress, but today 
30 to 40,000 people are still considered evacuees, and almost none of them have returned or plan on returning home. See, that's what's interesting. And this isn't unique to the nuclear industry or that sort of thing. After Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, New Orleans population hasn't recovered just because people moved away. They were just done with it. New Orleans had a population close to half a million in 2000, but by 2006, after the hurricane, it was about half that. Even today, it had gone up to about 370,000, but it's in decline. Now that's just one particular case, but that's that's another example of after the disaster happened, people don't always don't always want to return. It's like, do I really want to go back to that spot after they had me leave and for and for however long? It strikes me as a Japanese Pripyat. You see the indications of where people hastily brought whatever they could with them and left everything non-essential behind. You have in closets yeah. behind me toys, food items, a calendar, reads 2011, when the people evacuated. That is spooky and very different type of government than the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. It just shows that these sort of, these sort of accidents, disasters, panic, that part doesn't matter. Unlike a Chernobyl-like disaster, there was also an earthquake and a tsunami. You see the results of that. You see beautiful old shrines shaken down to their foundations. Thank you for bringing that up because that ultimately caused a lot more damage. If there's a factor that connects all major nuclear disasters besides radiation, it's poor communication. And that is because people don't really understand this very well. And this is something that we're still guilty of. At the plant I worked at, we had one designated person to talk to the media. Like that, that, was, that was their job. The translator of all the very technical stuff and inner workings of a nuclear power plant and relaying that in a way that people can understand. Because there's so much fear, so much intense emotion behind that. Even if that person did their job perfectly, things could just be taken, taken out of context just a little bit or the way someone's mood that person's mood was when they reported it just look at any other news example about about anything and of course all the whole fake news stuff that's out there and conspiracy theories that will inevitably be tacked on especially anything nuclear that it's a mess that part's gonna be a mess and i don't actually know of a way to fix that did the people of fukushima have to stay or go Shelter in place or evacuate? For how long could you eat the local food? How much radiation was too much? How could the public be sure of that? That's what the health physics team, the survey teams, all of those uh, first responder experts, that's, that's their goal to figure that out. Even with the most highly trained, even with a large team, there's still gonna be stuff that's missed. There's gonna be decisions that need to be made with, because time is of the essence, with 1% of the data. As an engineer, that's terrifying because it's like, I can, well, and you get around this, I could tell you this, but you're gonna have a super wide confidence interval of what the dose rate is. And again, that earthquake and tsunami is making everything so much worse because the technical term for this would be impediments to survey or impediments to evacuation. There's even a little emergency planning flow chart that we have for evacuations and yeah, and an earthquake and tsunami would most definitely meet that qualification that it's just going to be a mess. People and they're do aren't going to know what to do. They're doing this in the dark in an area that's already destroyed. All of these questions were mishandled in one way or another, which in turn both increased the mental health burden among evacuees and extended evacuation timelines. Thousands of people picking up their lives when poor communication is all they have to go on will inevitably be chaos. And in Fukushima's case, the mass movement was based on the recommended radiation dose limits of less than, more than, and much more than 20 millisieverts per year. Again, the zone of increased cancer risk is 100 millisieverts, and the occupational dose limit is 50 millisieverts. But that's for a radiation worker here. We're talking about members of the public. According to the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the acceptable dose rate for members of the public in an emergency situation is between 20 and 100 millisieverts per year. 
The problem with this number here is how long is an emergency situation? You can have the emergency that lasts for years because at least when I was trained on what an emergency is, it is the response, the evacuation. Are you in a continuous state of an emergency for years? Emergencies are not supposed to last for, for a long time. As in, this dose at, at 100 millisieverts per year, you're going to have some increased cancer rates. And to say that's acceptable, that doesn't sound right if you have an emergency that's lasting for north of 10 years. Outside of a disaster's immediate aftermath, 1 to 20 millisieverts a year is acceptable, the latter being the equivalent of a single CT scan. Deviation rates alone did it make sense, from a health physics perspective, to order the evacuation of everyone within a 30-kilometer radius of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant? Now, were all these evacuations just from the plant, oh, was just from the plant, or how much of it was just from from the earthquake? And I know the earthquake happened quickly. You can't really get out of the way of it, but just until the area is restored and can be re because they got water lines busted, power lines busted. The place isn't really habitable with with infrastructure. That's going to that's going to take some time. I mean, I, I get what he's saying about the dose, but the evacuation orders, you're going to have multiple disasters at once. It's not just from the nuclear plant here, though. So just looking at this transcript, extending something from 10 kilometer radius to 20 kilometer radius on the same day. That's a lot of panic. No. It did not. To a Japanese assessment of the risks and benefits of the evacuation in 2022, quote, from the results of the environmental dose rate measurement of the TEPCO accident, it seems that the area exceeding 100 millisieverts per year in the first year of the accident is not so large, even though three reactors melted. There is no need to evacuate the entire circular area around 30 kilometers from the nuclear power plant. So a couple of things here. A meltdown by itself is not a reason to order an evacuation. You would absolutely activate the emergency plan, but you evacuate, one criteria of an evacuation is for there to be a, re a radioactive release in progress. And you can have a completely contained meltdown. That's why reactor containment buildings exist. Yes, there was a release in Fukushima, but just, just in general, the uh, reactor meltdown, I know that term inspires a lot of fear in people, but that by itself will not result in an evacuation. Another thing, and this is something that I learned in my emergency re response training, I, I'll never forget this, it's morbid, but you order an evacuation, you're going to kill someone. And that's because of just the panic that results in, especially since it's going to be coming from a nuclear power plant, People are so afraid of nuclear things, they're probably not going to evacuate in an orderly fashion. So yeah, people are likely going to die in car accidents. Another example, another hurricane example, Hurricane Rita that same year as Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Because everyone was so freaked out after Katrina rapidly intensifying, there was a massive evacuation of, of Houston. And the storm didn't do much, at least talking about Houston. But the evacuation ended up killing more people. So ordering an evacuation isn't always the most conservative action. Sounds unbelievable at first, but because of the relatively low radiation rates in most places, there is a world where a large-scale evacuation of Fukushima could do more harm than good. Excessive evacuation can do that. Disasters did endure, however, was an evacuation-enabled assault on their mental health. After Three Mile Island, what? depression, anxiety, oh, PTSD, okay. conditions that are associated with early mortality, disability, and an overutilization of medical services. Now this is tricky because there could be other underlying conditions these individuals have that would have led to depression that aren't necessarily associated with an evacuation. Of course, the evacuation didn't help, but this is when you get into some weird correlations. That's very challenging to prove. I talk about this more in my Chernobyl series towards the end of that where I say how many people really died as a result of Chernobyl and that's when I get into the people lost trust in nuclear so they built a whole bunch of coal plants that cause a whole bunch more emissions which cause all of those health effects, poison, cancer rates, and that's the real bulk of the societal damage 
from that Chernobyl accident. It's kind of where do you draw the line when you make these sort of assessments. I'm not saying this is invalid to talk about the mental effects from the Fukushima accident. You're getting further away from the source because my initial thought when I talk about the evacuation, I was talking about people dying in in car accidents due to a panicked evacuation. I didn't even get into the uh, the mental health or the um, ooh, I'm panicking in my evacuation. I forgot to take my insulin shots and I'm diabetic and I left them at my house and I'm stuck in the evacuation traffic and now I'm dead. I didn't quite get into that sort of thing, but I can, I can see where these arguments are coming from, but we're distancing ourselves from the actual thing. Let me know what you think about drawing those lines because I think it can be a little difficult and distancing to say this was really because of Fukushima when you're looking at some like a, a long-term mental illness with a wide range like depression. Again, I don't mean to downplay any of these mental health issues. Over 2,300 people, mostly elderly and or hospitalized, died as an indirect result of the long-term evacuation of the Fukushima prefecture. Not surprised. That's the main the main de demographic that was affected by the by other large evacuations like the evacuation from Hurricane Rena. The long term evacuation of the TEPCO accident is not justified by the risks and benefits. So this quote right here has the potential to change the way emergency planning is done. Looking at those numbers for Fukushima. I could easily see a somewhat similar emergency response plan of a similar sort of, I don't know, to my knowledge, this hasn't been like fully evaluated, at least by the, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, if we're going to change where we pull the trigger for um, making an evacuation recommendation. That could be interesting. Drastic actions in the face of arguably manageable oh, radiation chart. rates come from the widespread adoption of the so-called linear no threshold model by many world governments and agencies. That right there is a problem because it has so many fundamental flaws. Using that model, I've talked about this in previous videos, every banana you eat is going to increase your risk of cancer. Every time you cuddle a loved one, it's going to increase your risk of cancer because people are naturally radioactive. The threshold, and again, there's there's your 100 millisieverts right there. The hormesis theory is a little bit of radiation is good for you. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission and nuclear power plants don't adopt that one, but it's an interesting idea. Many evacuated people in Japan remain unable to fully return home due to government-mandated restrictions based on conservative radiation exposure criteria. It's a very ironic statement how a conservative exposure criteria can lead to the non-conservative thing, a very non-conservative thing that can ultimately result in increased stress. All right, I, I, I can see where he's, where he's going with this. Fukushima prefectural government has said that the number of indirect deaths from evacuation in the prefecture is now greater than the number of people who died during the tsunami. That must just be the prefecture because I know close to 20,000 people died from the actual tsunami. Yeah, he must just be talking about the prefecture. A lot of the natural disaster evacuation would have superseded a lot of the nuclear stuff. I'm curious where they drew their equivalent of exclusion zones and low and low population zones. I know their emergency planning is different, but it's, yeah, I just wonder. We could change the radiation rates that create evacuation zones in the first place, bring them more in line with rates that we know cause health effects. That would be a game changer there. Exempting the Alara principle, it's a low, as low as reasonably achievable. It would really redefine what reasonable is and extend that to the trade-off of the risks of evacuation versus the risks of not evacuation. Because of a false perception of Chernobyl, frightened and uninformed mothers were dropping birth rates across Western Europe because they were ending their pregnancies in elective abortion. It has now been estimated that the total number of pregnancies, poor, lacking, and or false communication efforts indirectly ended this way was 1 to 200,000. Wow. That's the real cost of perceived risk versus actual risk. I don't even know what to say about that. Really, it just needs to come down to a reevaluation of the risks of evacuation and a reevaluation of the risks of what really happens during a meltdown, during fuel damage. And as I mentioned before, there are many scenarios that you wouldn't even order an evacuation, period. 
like it being so safely contained. I'm still hesitant to, to use the word mistake for evacuating Fukushima in light of that there was a radiological release combined with an earthquake and tsunami, but maybe we can do better. But really the ultimate goal is just not to have anything like this happen ever again. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.